Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. Rarely do we get to have a scientist of her caliber tell her own story. Art, you can have rhythms in many different ways. It's a very, very unique drug processing in this new technology. Today on Spotlight, what you'll find inside the Jane Goodall exhibit inside the St. Louis Science Center. Plus, the story of a young seamstress who uncovers dangerous truths about big tobacco. And then art that highlights the changing seasons and how people react to them. But first, a slew researcher studying genetic liver disease leads an investigation into an effective new drug. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. Strangely, if your liver is very sick, you have kind of changes on your hands, your fingers, your palms. Kendall yes. Maronk has a rare genetic liver disease, yet she's able to enjoy her high school years in Springfield, Missouri, without skipping a beat. I play volleyball and I try to make the best choices I can for my health, you know. Dr. Jeffrey Techman is guiding Kendall to maintain exercise and a healthy diet. Techman is the director of gastroenterology and hepatology at SSM Health Cardinal Glennon Children's Hospital. Kendall and her mom, Kara Oliver, make the trip from Springfield every year. Since I was three. We make it a girls weekend. Like we got a nice hotel room. We go out to eat. We make it really special. And now more than ever, the drive is proven to be worth it as Dr. Techman is not only Kendall's doctor. The SLU professor of biochemistry and molecular biology is a leading investigator in the development and clinical trials of a new drug therapy that may one day help Kendall. So the next phase of the study of Fizirceran is what we call phase three trial. The drug is specific to the rare genetic disease that she has. Alpha-1 and the trypsin deficiency. The liver makes a tremendous amount of alpha-1 protein called alpha-1 and trypsin, but in the alpha-1 liver disease, your liver is making an abnormal kind of alpha-1 protein. The liver and the lung disease called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. The lung disease is a blood deficiency. The liver disease is a buildup of it, something abnormal and can cause liver damage. The lung damage is from not having enough of the normal alpha-1 activity circulating in your blood and going to your lungs. Kendall's case was most frightening for Kara when she first found out after Kendall became very sick at 18 months of age. It was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. They pretty much told us that she was probably gonna die at a young age if she did not receive a liver transplant. A liver transplant is the only possible life-saving treatment available, which Dr. Techman says can be dangerous. But that wasn't needed. Good morning. Kara found Dr. Techman hoping for a treatment that will one day help Kendall if the disease should ever become life-threatening. She still has some, some swelling in her liver and she still has some swelling in her spleen. Um, there's still a chance that her liver would get a lot worse as a teenager or young adult. In 2011, Techman found a tool that seemed to cure the disease in the lab. It's a special, what we call small interfering RNA or siRNA. So the siRNA blocks the production of the alpha and protein in the liver. The toxic protein production is blocked. Techman has dedicated 30 years to alpha-1 liver disease, and the next step involves colleagues from around the world formed a remarkable team of business people, drug companies, biotechs, physicians, patients, scientists like me that work at universities. The drug therapy is in the form of an injection. The liver cleans the drug out of your blood and that concentrates the drug in the liver cells to turn off the production of the bad protein. So it's a very, very unique drug processing in this new technology. Techman became senior author of a small drug trial. That's when Techman had the most amazing experience. When I opened the email with the result, I started crying. A massive release of emotional energy to help these patients. I did not expect that level of effectiveness in such a short period of time. We showed that not only did their liver go back to normal, but in our first 15 patients, many of whom had scar tissue in the liver, 
half of those patients, the scar tissue improved in just six to 12 months of treatment. Dr. Techman has been watching over Kendall's case practically her whole life, and he does have concerns for her. She's right on the edge. Her, her, her liver is not normal, but it's doing well. Um, it could get worse in the next couple of years, or she could, could continue to do fine. But the next phase of the Fizirsaran trial is ideally positioned to help her if indeed she gets worse. The next phase will be the final phase to gather information to get full FDA approval. All right, any itching? No. Difficulty sleeping? No. Dr. Techman is amazing. Very lucky to have met him. Just because, I mean, my baby's gonna be okay. Kendall's life is filled with many joys. I love cooking and baking. It's so, I just love it. It's so great. I really want to go to culinary school and own my own bakery. Already, she's a success. I was hired for a, through a bakery to sell her products. She makes the macarons for them. It's the sweet moments in life Kendall and her family savor. With optimism, now more than ever. It's good. It's really good. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We're here at the St. Louis Science Center to talk about Becoming Jane, the evolution of Dr. Jane Goodall. This exhibition is about one of our most legendary living scientists, Dr. Jane Goodall, and it's through her perspective. Rarely do we get to have a scientist of her caliber tell her own story, but in this exhibition, she's talking directly to you about her life's work, and in fact, there's a hologram of Jane in here that'll talk directly to your family as you visit. If you don't know Dr. Jane Goodall, she is famous for discovering that chimpanzees had a lot of behaviors like us. Tool use, social bonds, personalities of their own. She was the first person to document this on the scientific record. It was a huge breakthrough. This exhibition isn't just about that. It's about her whole life and how she got to where she is today. To tell Jane's story of her childhood, there are a lot of her personal objects on display, including some of her favorite books from her childhood, hand-drawn notes of nature, she was a keen observer of nature even as a child. But I think most importantly, we have her real chimp doll, Jubilee, that she's had since she was a kid. Normally it sits on her dresser, but we have stolen it from her for this exhibition. And I think it's just cool to see not only were chimps important to her as a child, but it's something that she's carried with her in her entire life. We move through her adulthood where we learn how she got to where she is. She didn't start out as a scientist, as it turns out. A chance meeting in Africa led her to meet one of the greatest anthropologists of the 20th century, Dr. Louis Leakey, who assigned her to start researching chimpanzees with no scientific background whatsoever. But it was because of this lack of background and an extreme amount of patience on her part, she was able to make some discoveries about the behaviors of chimps that we had never seen before. She would take very detailed notes in a handwritten journal. And in fact, in this exhibition, there's an area where the uh, journal can really come to life and show you those chimpanzee behaviors in an animated form. There's an area where you can learn to vocalize like a chimpanzee, which is an absolute blast. And it's important when you experience that part not to be shy. Really give it your all because that's how the chimpanzees do it. There's also some of those incredible photos from National Geographic that a lot of us found in those magazines as our first experience with Dr. Jane Goodall's work. You'll also move into the current time and some of those issues that chimpanzees and their habitats are facing. And that's what Jane is working on today. Speaking of that conservation, she'll tell you of the ways that you can help out the world a little bit. And behind me, you'll see the Tree of Hope. And in that area, you can make a pledge, a small thing that you can do on a daily basis to make the world a little bit better. When you make that pledge, it becomes a leaf on that tree, which will remain up there till the end of the exhibition. And by the end of it, it'll just be covered with leaves. And those are all a little reminder of the ways in which all of us can work together to make the world a little bit better. This exhibition will be on display here at the St. Louis Science Center until April, and you can find more information at slsc.org. HEC Media, recognized, celebrated, honored time and again for excellence in the industry. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries, individual craft achievements to overall excellence. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org.
Born and raised in Asheville, North Carolina, Adele Myers draws on her own family's history working in the tobacco industry for her debut historical novel, The Tobacco Wives. Set in 1946 in Brightleaf, North Carolina, the tobacco capital of the South, this beautifully detailed, immersive novel follows a young seamstress who uncovers dangerous truths about big tobacco. The Tobacco Wives has been included in BookBub's Best Historical Books of 2022 list, and it's been named a most anticipated book by USA Today and Pop Sugar. For today's conversation, Adele is joined by Ashley Hasty, creator of the Hasty Booklist Review blog and co-host of the Best of Women's Fiction podcast. Now that we've covered how you got to this point, I want to dive into the book. So will you tell our viewers what The Tobacco Wives is about? Sure. So The Tobacco Wives is the story of a young seamstress in 1946, North Carolina, who inadvertently discovers dangerous truths about the big tobacco empire, ruling the American South and and also employing her. The story is told through the eyes of a 15 year old girl. Her name is Maddie Sykes, and she's just lost her father in World War II. And her mother basically has a breakdown. She doesn't know how she's going to support Maddie and, um, and herself after losing the breadwinner of the family, the father. And so she abandons Maddie at her great aunt Etta's house in the fictional town of Brightleaf, North Carolina. And that's the tobacco capital of the South. In Brightleaf, uh, Maddie's aunt Etta has a thriving sewing business. She sews for everyone in town, but she really makes her money sewing for the wealthy wives of the tobacco executives in town. And these are the women that everyone calls the tobacco wives. So Maddie, when she initially arrives in Brightleaf, she's really enamored with these women um, and excited to get to to know them. She's not usually in Brightleaf that time of year. But as she gets drawn into their world, she begins to see that things aren't as perfect as she thought they were. And she runs across some information that she's not supposed to see and has to decide what to do with that. You grew up in Asheville, North Carolina, in the heart of tobacco country. You had family who worked in and around tobacco, as most people did back then. Did -hmm. you grow up hearing stories about what it was like to work in tobacco, or is this something you looked into and researched later in life as an adult? I did both. Um, The seed of the idea for the story came from the fact that both sets of my grandparents you know, lived and worked in Winston-Salem, which was the home of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco. And I spent my summers there with uh, most of my time with my grandmothers. And one of my grandmothers was a hairdresser for the wives of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco executives. What do you hope readers take away after reading The Tobacco Wives? I hope they'll learn and, and be f- kind of fascinated by this world. Um, I know that's something I love about books is kind of learning about this whole new world. But also I think it's about a young woman and and other women too in the book, finding their voice and their courage. And so I would hope that they take that away. To find out why her story has been in the process for about 20 years, watch the full interview at HECmedia.org. They are the best-selling authors and all of your favorite genres. For in-depth, one-on-one interviews, go to HECmedia.org. We're here at Webster Arts for the Seasonal Rhythms exhibit. Seasonal Rhythms is an exhibit about the changes of the seasons through time and how all of us transition through lots of seasons in our lives. The most exciting part is how the artists have interpreted this in their own medium. So as a juror for the Seasonal Rhythms exhibit, I was charged with choosing Uh, 35 pieces from I think about 135 artists and they were all great pieces so it was really hard to narrow it down. It was a really exciting time for me to get to jury my first show. This is the first time I've done this before and one of the neatest parts was knowing that there was art coming from all over the country from all types of artists. And the other part that was so exciting is I made it my mission to make sure that I include 
pieces from multiple types of media. One of the most interesting parts was, yes, the art that they sent was very seasonal and had to do with weather and how the seasons change, but also it was really interesting to me about visually how each piece had these rhythms, and that's kind of what I chose, so that in the room, the art would look as if it goes together, because each piece, if you look at them individually, have rhythms of their own, in addition to also being seasonally inspired. When I say rhythms, uh, in music, everybody understands that usually means the beat within the music. Um, with art, you can have rhythms in many different ways, through repetition of the elements of design, through repetition of lines, through repetition of your subject matter, through repetition of color accents. I hope when people move through the exhibit that they feel that rhythm. I hope they feel like they can move along from piece to piece in a rhythm. And I hope that when they view the pieces that they feel the rhythms and that when they're finished, they feel as if they have gone through all the seasons of the year. You have until December 23rd to visit this exhibit. And if you wanna learn more, visit webster-arts.org. The Museum of Transportation's Holiday Fun, later on Spotlights. Every year, Americans celebrate Veterans Day. But did you know since 1944, St. Louis has set aside one day to honor one soldier in particular. December 12th is Wendell Oliver Pruitt Day. The name may sound familiar, but who was the man behind it? And why was he so celebrated for decades? Pruitt was part of the first black flying unit known as the Tuskegee Airmen. They were a distinguished group who enlisted in the Army Air Corps Cadet Flying Program in 1941 and trained in Tuskegee, Alabama. Well, he's from St. Louis. He came from the Ville. That's where he was brought up. And he came from a family of 10. Wendell was the youngest of Elijah and Melanie Pruitt's large brood. Born in 1920, he attended Sumner High School and briefly studied at what is now Harris Stowe State University. He transferred to Lincoln University in Jefferson City, known in the 1940s as the Black Harvard of the Midwest, and where military traditions run deep. He was a member of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. He was well liked by his peers. I mean, there were several articles, you know, after his passing, you know, people reminiscing about him and very popular on campus. At the time, Lincoln University was one of three black colleges that conducted civil pilot training and is the institution that laid the foundation for Pruitt's career. And he only had like a month and a half to go to finish his degree, but he, he heeded the call like a lot of other young men did on this campus. And it was just amazing how they uh, sacrificed themselves for their country. Prue was already a licensed pilot when he enlisted. Just two years earlier, blacks were not allowed to fly until President Roosevelt relented under pressure and ordered the civilian pilot training program. Pruitt's red tail plane was christened Alice Joe after his fiance. This display downtown at Soldiers Memorial History Museum pictures Pruitt handing a ring over for safekeeping. That ring was left with his mechanic or the young man that took care of his airplane every time he went on a mission. Known to be a quiet man, Pruitt's fellow airmen describe him as being fierce in the air. He was credited with shooting down three enemy planes and destroying eight others on the ground. But it was what happened flying over the Adriatic Sea in the Mediterranean when Pruitt and his wingman, Lieutenant Lee Archer, earned the moniker, the gruesome twosome. He'd pull ahead and I'd pull right behind him and try to stay on him. He was a heck of a pilot. And just staying there sometime was a full-time job. With no bomber or torpedoes on board, Pruitt had sunk a German destroyer the size of a football field using only machine guns. One of those bullets hit all that ammunition on deck and what should have been a small boom became a big boom. That ship was so damaged that it would have to be scuttled. And he is the only one in history, since, before and after, that has got credit for sinking a German ship with a 50 caliber bullet. That was in 1944, and in December, St. Louis welcomed home their decorated hero. Posters were put up all over the city. A parade was planned, but cold weather forced the celebration inside City Hall. 
His niece, Judith Pruitt, proudly recalls this picture of her mother Vesta and grandmother Melanie attending the ceremony with then Mayor Aloysius Kaufman. Some of the uh, people that knew him that said when he visited the schools and everything, he was so kind and quiet and but never yeah. into self at all. Yeah. To me is to to me the most important thing. Yeah. I liked his humbleness. Captain Pruitt told his family he was anxious to return to action flying over Europe, but his transfer was delayed due to the death of President Roosevelt. Instead, he was sent back to Tuskegee to instruct new fighter pilots. The last time he came back, he told my mother, he said, um, these airplanes are really bad news because they gave them the worst airplanes, you know, just kind of junk, but they flew them. And he said, when, when he goes up in the air, it feels like he's flying in a casket. Those were prophetic words. In April 1945, Captain Pruitt took a student up in a trainer plane. It crashed and both were killed. Pruitt was only 24 years old. Judith doesn't have many mementos of her famous uncle and cherishes a letter a neighborhood friend sent to his mother back in 1945. I was of course sorry to hear of Wendell's death and it's indeed too bad that his army career had to end up like that. I suppose though, that's a pilot sticking to that kind of business for such a long period. But St. Louis would not forget their hero. In the 1950s, his name, along with local Congressman William Igo, was lent to the ill-fated federal housing project called Pruitt Igo. In 1984, the Pruitt Military Academy was established, but is now known as the Pruitt Charter School. And in 2007, President George Bush awarded all Tuskegee Airmen the Congressional Gold Medal, which Judith proudly keeps. And to further her uncle's legacy, Judith and her mother helped raise money for a mural by local artist Solomon Thurman, which celebrates the history of black Americans in flight. Anyone passing through Terminal 1 at Lambert Airport can spot Captain Pruitt, his wingman, and the red tail fighter plane. Captain Wendell Oliver Pruitt is buried at St. Peter's Cemetery in Normandy, Missouri. First person, real world, expert driven. That's the focus of the videos, lesson plans, and activity ideas you'll find at our educational website, educate.today. We are here at the National Museum of Transportation celebrating the holiday season. We have train displays, we have a miniature train you can ride, we've got Santa, live reindeer, carolers, all kinds of holiday fun this year. So one of the highlights of our holiday festivities is our holiday train displays and they change them up every year. There are seek and finds. The longer you look at them, the more fun little details and tidbits you can see. So it's a lot of fun for everybody. We have here two train displays, two of the largest in St. Louis area for holidays. Uh, one is the Macy's display that was in the Macy's window downtown in Famous Bar for 25 years and when they closed we contacted them and told them we'd be willing to put it up every Christmas and run it. And one of our people out here built a facade around it so it looks like it's actually sitting in the window down at Famous Bar. The same time we took that in, we were building what you see behind us which is what we call the Des Lee layout. We have a lot of little figures doing snow angels and kids going around a Christmas tree. There's also an operating carousel an operating ski lift, and of course Santa talks and sings with the kids. Then you'll also see in the middle, probably the biggest thing we're asked about more than anything else is the waterfall in the center of the layout. And actually my wife does the waterfalls. It's basically just saran wrap with paint, but it, with the lighting it comes off looking like a real waterfall. We have strange things on the layout too, like we have a Tyrannosaurus in a cave. We have Thomas the Train running in Ronda Village, always a big hit with the kids. Parents and grandparents that bring their kids back almost every day to look at the layout and say they see something new every day when they're here. The holiday train displays really are what make our holiday festivities so unique and exciting. In addition to the holiday train displays, Santa will be here available for photo opportunities. Families with kids are welcome to come and visit. You can take your own photos with him. The live reindeer will also be here for a few days. You can ride a historic streetcar on select days. We've got the miniature train running, all weather permitting, of course. Lots of holiday fun, and all of that is included with admission. 
Our holiday festivities continue throughout the holiday season and you can check out a schedule of events at tnmot.org. Vox Bible. Hear his interesting written comments about music. Also, tis the season for holiday lights inside the zoo's wild lights display. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.